Morning. Uh, I am, as most of you are aware, I am not Jason, but for the benefit of our visitors and the people watching online, um, I'm not Jason. My name is uh, Mitchell Ward. I uh, help out with the tech and media booth in the back most weeks. Um, but this week, uh, Jason is out of town, so he asked me to fill in for him. Um, let's see. There it is. This is what I was looking for. This is a handy little thing. lets me change the slides whenever I want. So, Who remembers what Jason talked about last week? Now, he's been doing a series called Exploring the Church, um, and I'm going to kind of do a little, uh, my own little take on it. He's been talking about um, practices that the ancient church had, studying them, how we can learn from them. I wanted to take that and crunch it down into something that could apply to each of us here individually. Um, past couple weeks, uh, Jason has mentioned before the concept of, uh, of three types of sermons. There's a head sermon, a heart sermon, and a hand sermon. These past few sermons, I think, have mostly been head or heart. So this week, I want to focus a little bit more on the hands. What are small things or just acts that we as individuals can do to bring us closer to Jesus and closer to that ancient church. Now, last week at the end of his sermon, Jason said that he had three goals for things that he wanted Berean to work on. Uh, now, we're going to do a little popcorn session. I'm going to need some interaction here. Who remembers what they were? Let's just shout them out if you remember them. I can give you a hint. There are three of them. Let's, uh, let's see. Well, let's walk through it. What's our mission statement here? This one's easy. It's right here on the banner. Through Jesus, be a place of healing for yesterday, help for today, and hope for tomorrow. And in, in extension of that, we have what we call the REACH program, where we've split our resources of our church into three key areas. And you should know what most of those are. The first is evangelism, outreach, reach all. The second Discipleship, reach above. And the third, next generation, reach ahead. Jason's three points that he wanted to work on for the church were related to those three. The first one, give more to the next generation. The second, care more for the powerless and poor. And the third, equip the congregation to pray and study better. Now you'll notice that those three goals happen to very clearly line up with our mission statement and align with our REACH program. That wasn't unintentional. That was intentional. So this sermon today, although I would call it less a sermon and more just kind of a, a dialogue that I'm opening with all of you, what are things that we can do individually, all of us, that get us started down that path while we're working on the grander things? I often think that we get too stuck sometimes as a church um, thinking about and working on the grand things that our church does. We have big outreach programs, which are great. Absolutely. We just had our, our movie night in the community that was wonderful. A lot of people attended. A wonderful movie was shown, The Wizard of Oz. We have our, our classes that we put together, which are, again, great places of learning and discussion where we can talk amongst uh, one another and, and grow. But we also need to be aware that there are other important things as well. Smaller acts, acts that don't have to come from an entire congregation, but can come from just one or two people. So that's what this uh, sermon this week is going to be about. And I'm going to, in the spirit of this series, Exploring the Church, I'm going to be looking at things that the ancient church did, or rather the ancient apostles did, that can give us some inspiration. Um, so, for those of you who have uh, Bibles and like to flip through them, don't worry. We're going to be in Acts basically throughout the entire sermon, so you won't have to flip very far. Let's talk about this first goal, though. Give more to the next generation. Let me start by saying that the next generation, uh, the children and, and teens and young adults among us, are vitally important for the health of the church. 
Now, I, I feel like it shouldn't be a surprise for me to say that, but sometimes I think in the hustle and bustle, we can not forget but let it slip our minds, let it fall into the wayside as we focus on other things that uh, are equally as important. But the next generation, um, which now is my generation, Generation Z, and the generation after me, the children being born now, which uh, I believe are being called Generation Alpha, are of extreme importance for the next few decades for the church. According to a recent study by uh, a group called Cooperative Election Study, they estimated through polling online and through phone calls that 44.9, almost 45% of my generation are non christian Now, they determined that via several categories, you know, um, when they polled them, they asked them, do you identify as a Christian? If so, uh, what denomination? If not, um, are you outright atheistic? Are you agnostic? Or do you just don't care? A majority of them said that they hadn't thought about it or didn't care at all. That's a dangerous number, though. Almost half of my generation now is considering themselves as to be non-Christian. Maybe a little spiritual, but not a Christian, no. So how do we reach the next generation? How do we give more to them? The temptation, and don't try to hide behind uh, anything here, the temptation is to sit them down and give them a good old lecture, right? sit them down, have a talk at them, and they will definitely listen. They won't. The temptation is there. I have certainly felt it. Raise your hand if you've ever felt this, seeing a a young person in your life who's important to you, perhaps uh, your own child or a grandchild or a, a niece or a friend of the family, seeing them going down certain paths of life, making decisions that you yourself have made that were mistakes. You see them making those same mistakes, and you just want to sit them down and shake them until they listen. I felt it. Even being the very young age that I am, I have felt it seeing people younger than me. And I know that many of you have as well. But I'm going to tell you, it's not effective. It doesn't work. You see, lectures and rules and telling people to do things a certain way doesn't work if the people you're telling it to aren't willing to listen. That's where the core of how we can start doing this begins, by getting them to be willing to listen. We're going to first turn to Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Follow along with me as I read them here. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now there's a couple key things to pay attention to here. First, this passage in the Bible makes a really big deal out of the fact that Timothy's mother was Jewish and was a believer, but father was Greek. Now, that's because in that culture and that, in that time, that would have been a huge deal. However, that's not the thing that I want us to pay particular attention to. And Instead of looking at what the text explicitly says here, I want to look between the text. Timothy, at this point, would have been uh, probably a young man, somewhere between the ages of uh, 15 and 25 by some estimates, perhaps a little bit older. But in that culture, he would have been seen as a young man or um, a little more than just a little more than a teenager or or a child. But... Look at what Paul does here. He sees Timothy, this young man who's been working in the church. People speak well of him, and Paul wants to mentor him. He wants to teach him, wants to give him lectures and have him listen. So what does he do? 
He doesn't just sit them down, have a one-time conversation about a thing, and then forget about it and never speak about it again. He takes Timothy with him. And they went all around, and Timothy helped Paul in his ministry for a while. Paul grew a relationship with Timothy first, teaching him as he went. That's the important thing. Lecturing from a stranger means absolutely nothing. Not even I would really listen to a stranger who came up to me and told me how to live my life. I don't think any of you would either. But relationships are where reaching the next generation begins. So how does that translate to little things that we can do to help aid in that goal? This one is really simple. It doesn't even take all that much. Spend more time with young people, with the next generation. Make it as, I'll make it as broad as something of ages 1 to 30. Spend more time with them. Whether they're related to you or not, if they're people that you know that are acquaintances, make an effort to be with them more. Even just 10 minutes. Even just a call or a text to ask them how they're doing and how their day's going. Slowly start building that relationship. Earn their trust. Earn the relationship with them. And then you will have the opportunity to help them, to guide them, to reach them, to give them more. The next goal is to care more for the powerless and poor. Now understand, Christians should absolutely be caring and compassionate to all peoples. It doesn't matter your um, race, gender, your money situation, your sexual orientation. We should be caring and loving to all the peoples of the world so that we can spread the love of Jesus to them. We do that because these people need us. The definition of poor, powerless and poor has definitely changed from what it used to mean when it was written and done in the ancient church. Can we agree on that? The powerless and poor in our culture, in America today, are just not the same as they were. The poor in America are, to be frank, much, much better well-off physically than any other previous culture in history. Now, of course, with any culture, there will be those who cannot provide for themselves, cannot provide for their family. But that is a small section of America now. And if we go by that definition, our reach, our extent, is limited in the scope of people that we will reach. So then, how do we take care of someone who's physical needs, food and water and shelter and maybe even finances are met. Well, we're going to have to look beyond the physical. We're going to hop down to the next chapter in Acts, Acts 17, verses 19 and 20. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the area Pegasus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. So one chapter later in, uh, in Acts, Paul has found himself in Athens after traveling through many different areas, eventually winding up in Athens. When Paul arrived, he took a tour around the city and saw that those, these were very deeply religious people of the faiths of their time. Everywhere he looked, there were idols to all kinds of different gods and goddesses. He even later remarks that he even found a shrine to the unknown god. So Paul took it upon himself to go down um, to a synagogue and speak with the Jews and, and the Greeks who lived here. While he was speaking and teaching, some, um, I guess you could call them philosophers, 
uh, came to him and began discussing with him and asked him, asked him for knowledge. In this instance, Paul is not meeting a physical need. It's not like these people here need this information in order to survive and go about their daily lives. No, Paul is instead meeting two other kinds of needs. Firstly, he's meeting a spiritual need, which is met any time that we reach out to someone who is unchurched. Secondly, he's meeting an educational need. Yes, even, even education can be a need when it relates to things that relate to the Bible. That is the goal of this, uh, this second um, section of this sermon, is that we need to expand our view of needs. Don't just meet physical needs. We need to meet other kinds of needs. Emotional, mental, spiritual, educational, relational. Hopping all the way back to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. This is a familiar story that I think all of us have heard at least once before. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. Like I said, that's a familiar story. It's one of uh, the earliest stories mentioned in the book of Acts about the early church. And we see that the early church is struggling. Uh, at this point, it seems like the, uh, the apostles have not particularly moved away from their area, but instead are, are not yet dispersed out and, and preaching. But they're already running into issues. Tensions. Cultural tensions. Racial tensions. That's what this boils down to. And sure... It's tensions about meeting the physical needs of each group's widow. But that's not the only need that the apostles are meeting here. Look between the lines again. What else are the apostles doing that's aiding the church? They're mending the rift. They're, fi- they're meeting the relational needs of the early church. Mending the gap between Greek and Jew. Pay attention again to verse 5. This proposal pleased the whole group. That's important. Not referred to as two separate entities in verse 5, but just one. How does this translate to things that we can do today, though? These are both examples of fairly momentous acts. And I don't think most of us would be willing to go down uh, to the local Kroger or Walmart and start teaching philosophy. Well, I might, but I don't think any of you would. (laughs) I use these examples as a way to try to expand your horizons on what can be done. Never, ever underestimate small acts of kindness. You never know what a small, tiny thing can mean to someone whose needs aren't met, their relational needs, their emotional needs, their spiritual needs. So start doing small acts of kindness, things that you wouldn't normally think of every time the opportunity presents itself. When you're in the drive through getting a McDonald's burger and you see a person behind you ordering something, pay for their food. Maybe they need that extra $10 for something else. Maybe it would mean the world to them that a stranger out of the kindness of their heart would pay for their meal. We've all seen the construction around here recently, right? And how uh, invasive it's been on the highways in these past few weeks. It's been annoying for sure. And that comes from someone who uh, spends their job traveling all the roads. But. It's also kind of necessary. 
without repeated maintenance and repair, our infrastructure, our roads fall apart. So next time you see some construction workers, give them a thank you. Get some of your friends and go and buy them a meal. Do the same for our police force, our healthcare workers, firefighters. Small acts of Christian love will reach further than we will ever know. And you will never know the impact that your acts have. But you can be content in the knowledge that you did them. The third and final goal, equip congregation to pray and study. This one is really important. Equally as important, I think, as reaching to the next generation or reaching out with small acts of kindness. Without knowledge and without discipleship or discipline, we as Christians are helpless against the enemy and the world. There are many, many, many difficult questions and difficult situations that we as Christians cannot ignore. It's hard to be a Christian in today's times. When things get rough, it's hard to be a Christian. It's especially hard to talk to people who experience those hard times. The first thing they'll do is they'll ask you, why me? Why did I have to lose my job? Why did my son or daughter have to die in the military? Those are hard. But we have to have, if not the answer, then at least our own feelings and thoughts about them. We can't just be blindly trying to lead the blind to Jesus. So how can we begin to answer and comfort those who need it if we can't speak our faith with confidence? How do we get that confidence? Faith and knowledge. Both of them equally important. You can't just choose one over the other. They don't make up for each other like that. You need both. Faith and knowledge. If you are going to go out there, bring people to Jesus, bring some healing help and hope for them, you have to have both. Acts 17, 11 through 12. Flipping all the way back. Most of you should be familiar with this. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. At this point in Acts, Paul has essentially been chased out of Thessalonica um, by the Jews residing there. And actually later, when the Thessalonians find out that Paul is in Berea, they will cause trouble in Berea too. But after reaching Berea, Paul begins his usual thing. He goes out and he preaches and he teaches. But the Berean Jews, of which, make no mistake, we named ourselves after were not only willing, but were eager to listen and learn. When our church opened our doors, we were dead set on emulating the Bereans as laid out by Acts. Now, Jason has said that he's uh, going to start a a little thing about um, about personal scripture study in the future, so I won't uh, go into the grand specifics of that. Like I said, the sermon's about what small acts that we can do. So here are the small things that we can do. First, we can engage. In Acts 17 previously, Paul engages with the Athenians. We just talked about them not only to teach, but to learn and be better equipped if he encounters their worldview again. Those philosophers that he talked in Greece, I guarantee he didn't do all the talking. I guarantee Paul learned just as much as he gave because it's information he needed to continue his ministry. 
engage with people not of the church. Don't try to lecture to them. Don't try to preach to them. Instead, listen to them. Listen to what they have to say. What do they believe? Why do they believe that? In the process, you build a relationship with them, which makes it easier to reach them. The second thing is using these right here. Listening. Let me scroll back here. What does it say right there? Let's see. Uh, now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great, what? Eagerness. Word that would not have been written down for them. They would have had to have listened to it from Paul and the people that were speaking to them. I think we can all agree here that when Jason is on this stage, he does an absolutely amazing job, right? An absolutely fantastic job. Every time he steps on this stage, I feel so humbled by my lack of knowledge. So I listen. I listen to what he has to say. That's all you need to do. Listening is not hard. Listen to his sermons. Even take some notes. It doesn't have to be comprehensive notes. It doesn't have to be even small notes. Take notes on what's important. What's important to you? If it's some side comment that Jason said that you want to study up on, maybe that's the only note you take. At least you took it. Now that's going to stick in your mind. Now you're going to take the opportunity to learn and grow. The third thing that we can do is relate. And whereas the other um, uh, engage was about engaging with people outside the church, relate is about engaging with people in the church. We have some wonderful, wonderful fellowship programs here. We have a women's study. We have a men's group that meets. And I, I, of course, I can't speak for the women's study. I have not participated in quite a while. <laughs> but at the men's study, sure, we build relationship and fellowship by talking about whatever strikes our fancy, sports relationships, um, you know, how uh, current world events, but we also talk about the Bible, we talk about our faith. We talk about what certain things mean and what we believe them to be. Like iron sharpens iron, I believe the verse goes, so a friend sharpens another friend. That's what we're doing. Every time you talk and relate with someone inside the church, you know, dis debate your ideas, talk about them, discuss them, you're sharpening each other. Even if you don't agree, even if you come out of it disagreeing and just saying, well, listen, we just believe differently, I guess, that doesn't have to reflect your relationship. In my opinion, there is a difference between debate and argument. A debate is when both sides come to the discussion openly and without preconceptions about who's right or wrong. An argument is when one side decides or knows that they are right and will not listen to the other. Debate is great and healthy. Arguments are not. So how does this all kind of wrap up? We've reached the end now. Uh, I've given you, I hope I've given you some ideas. If something has struck you or inspired or stuck with you, follow up on that. Because I'm going to tell you, this is too important to let procrastination delay it. Don't act tomorrow. Don't even act today. Don't act an hour from now. Act right now. Now, whatever you can, even if you don't think it'll mean much, do it anyway. We do not have the luxury of time anymore. The church in America is continuing to lose ground. People's families and homes are being broken. How selfish is it to sit back and say, I'm just too busy? 
That's the most frustrating excuse I've ever heard, and I say it myself too many times. I'd help that person stranded on the side of the road with their car broken down, but I'm just too busy. I'm late for work. I'd talk to my kid about their terrible behavior, but I'm too busy. I'm doing thing, other things for the school or the church or work or what. The worst excuse known to mankind. If it really mattered to you, you'd make time. Your friends, your coworkers, your families, very spiritual souls rest on your ability to act. And I'll admit, I'm not perfect. I've got friends and family and coworkers that I have been absolutely neglecting spiritually. They need what we've got, and I've not been giving it to them. And that's on me. That is my sin that I have to repent for and try and be better about. But that inaction has to end today, or else it will never end, and millions, billions of people will never know Jesus and the healing, the help, and the hope that he brings. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. We pray for opportunity. We pray for awareness of those opportunities and the strength and courage to act. Show us that it doesn't have to be the grand big things. It can be the small ones, the tiny ones that no one ever thinks about. Give us the courage to act upon those. Give us the love and grace to show to people who need you. Pray that we are receptive to Jason's continued teaching about this topic and other topics and that that teaching strengthens us. Pray that we build the relationships amongst ourselves and amongst those outside the church. And above all, I pray that we continue to reach toward you no matter the consequences. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.